Good morning. How are you? Good. I heard a few of you. Not many. Good morning. Thank you. I love it when you talk back in a respectful manner. Welcome to Ridgewood Church of God. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. In the Bible, it says that we have power of life and death in the tongue. Amen. And we're going to speak a little life this morning. If you will stand with us this morning, I am the righteousness of God. I stand in covenant with him. And through this, I have new life, new anointing, and new power. I will not worry. That's a big deal right now, isn't it? Will you say it with authority this morning? I will not worry, nor have fear. Lord, your word and your spirit, they comfort me. I am increasing in your knowledge and in your wisdom. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body through your covenant. That's not man's covenant. That's God's covenant. Amen. I am healthy. I am blessed. There is nothing missing and nothing broken. You have made me a blessing. Now, some of you may think you're not a blessing or maybe your neighbor's not a blessing. But you're a blessing to God. Amen. And everything I touch is blessed. Lord, I thank you that my family walks in obedience to your word and to your will. Will you make this your prayer today? Take me, Lord. Take Ridgeville Church of God to the highest place in glory. Amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we start our service today? Amen. Amen. Hasn't God been good to us already this day on this Lord's Day? The first Lord's Day of April 2022. And it's so good to see each and every one of you here. I trust you came looking for a blessing. And may you have a blessing before you leave. I'm looking for a good service. And I thank God for allowing us to be here just like we are. We had a good Sunday school lesson. And if you're not coming to Sunday school, you're missing out. Now, I know we call them life groups around here, but I'm up the old school. I can't hardly get away from Sunday school. But you know what I'm talking about. And we're just so glad to have you. And we have some guests with us this morning. And we want you to feel at home. And may the Lord bless you. And may he bless you so much that you'll want to come again soon. Please be seated. Let me read these announcements. Please uh, listen up. I don't want you to miss out on them. And if you happen to miss out on some, if you want to know more, just talk to me after church and I'll fill you in. No church staff meeting or PM service tonight due to funeral at 2 p.m. Women's meeting Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Men's breakfast this Saturday here at the church at 8 a.m. And Easter extravaganza Saturday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and we still need some candy. And Wednesday night will be the deadline for that. So help us out with that. And uh, let's be a blessing. No p.m. service next Sunday night as we support the youth rally at the New Covenant Church of God Mount Pleasant campus with guest speaker Chad Fickett at 6 p.m. So let's keep that in mind. You know, it's a lot going on. So I know sometimes we can forget, but we also have the calendars ready. They're available out on the table in the vestibule, so please get one. That way you can keep looking at it and maybe not miss out on anything. Now let me ask you for your prayer reports, I mean praise reports or prayer requests. And I want to start on my left over here. Anybody? Sister? Amen. Yes. Anybody else in that section before I move? Bran? Oh, amen. Yes, we'll remember her. 
Her name is Bobby Sue. <laughs> I've helped Brad out. How about this section right here? Anybody? Before I move. Sister? Amen. Yes. Anybody else in that section before I move? This section here? Anybody? Sister? Amen. Yes. Anybody else in this section? Brother? Amen. Yes. Anybody else before I move? Extreme right? Sister. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Let's keep praying for our sister and for one another. Anybody else? Sister. Praise God. It's good to have them back. Anybody else before we move? Up on the platform? Yes. Well, praise the Lord for that. You know I'm going to be praying. And I know she needs all of our prayers. Pastor? To God be the glory. I know there are others. Sister Sherry is going to school. And I think Sister Odom said that she was going to school. So let's pray for all of them. That God will help them. I know there will be times of discouragement. But I pray for their encouragement. And they'll have bulldog tenacity. Hang in there, you know, like a rusty fish hook. <laughs> until, they're, until they get through it. I know it takes a lot of that. And let's pray for all of our educators at all levels that's trying to get it right, that they will get it right, and that God will bless them. And, you know, I do. I pray for them every day. They need our prayers. And let's pray for all in the medical profession. You know, there's so much to pray about, and I, I won't take the time to name all these that I normally pray about, but let's pray for one another. Let's pray for the church of Jesus Christ worldwide, not just this church. Let's pray for one another. You know, Jesus is coming. I want us all to be ready. I want our loved ones ready to go. And we'll be out of here. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Would you stand, please? Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for allowing us to come together in the name of Jesus. We thank you for what you've already accomplished here today, the Sunday school class now, and this worship service. We just thank you the way you just blessed and helped us all, Lord God. And for you making all this possible. Thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl that you've sent this way. We pray for a rich blessing upon everyone. We pray for all those in here and those in the facility in the back, Lord God, that everything that's said and done will be according to your will. Lord, we have seen you move many times and you've answered many prayers for us. And Lord, you heard the prayer request given in this morning. And we pray that you'll intervene in behalf of every one of them, Lord, and take care of them in your way and in your time. And we know that it will always be right, even when you say no. We thank you, Lord God, for listening to us, for helping us. And Jesus, you said for us to ask and we shall receive. So, we, Father, we're asking in Jesus' name that you'll answer all of these prayer requests and, and we'll give you the praise for it. We thank you for them right now. And we love you and praise you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll have your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John, while you're turning, let me also invite you. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that's going on next week and then sunrise service the week after at 7 a.m. I know all of you early birds would love to join me there. Um, but let me say today at 2 o'clock, we do have a funeral. 
many of you know uh, the Roselle family. It's tragic when death comes, expected or unexpected. Life has a way of checking us. We hear today marking the sixth mark of a young child taken too early. But God has proven time and time again he's faithful. That we can rely on him. And the passage today as we enter into this holy month, we'll be celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus. And why did he come? Simply because of what you and I can quote right behind me. But sometimes we leave out verse 17. And so I want to bring that to us as well. And so you know these, the words of Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him. It doesn't matter your educational level. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, rich or poor. All you got to do is believe in him. And the Bible goes on and it says, and that you won't perish, but have everlasting life. There's no death in heaven. Tears are wiped away. But look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. We all have a chance to be saved. We all have opportunity. All we got to do is ask. And so I want you to grab your tithes and offering today. And I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that you cared enough about us to to give up your only begotten son in this month, God, as we honor the death and resurrection. We know that the God that we serve is not dead. We know the God that we serve is not just still in a grave somewhere, but he's alive. And the word says as we begin to read it, he's making intercessions for us, sitting on the right hand of the Father. Show us your glory today, God. Let liberty reign in this house and as we worship you in all forms of worship, whether it's through the giving, whether it's through the worship, whether it's through the praise or preaching, God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the ransom you paid. Now may we give you all that we have as our form of saying thank you. And may your name be lifted high in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you come and bless the house of God this morning? Like 
the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing. conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy 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 oh this is a
I can contain my praise Cause I know that I've been saved Lord, you found me, you healed me You called me from the grave You gave me your real love I thank you, Jesus You washed my sins away Forgiven, you came and set me free. Oh Lord, that's what your mercy did for me. Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from the grave. You gave me your real love. I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away, and now I'm living like I'm forgiven. What your mercy did for me. Sing it with me. And every morning, mercy will restore me. I will proclaim. And even if the world may fall before me, the grave. You gave me your real love. I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. And now I'm living like I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. Oh, Lord, that's what your mercy did for me. Lord, you found me. You healed me. You called me from the grave. You gave me your real love. I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. But now I'm living like I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. Oh, Lord, that's what your mercy did for me. And that's what your mercy did for me. Amen. God, we just thank you, Lord. God, we worship you, Lord. God, we thank you for the blood that you shed just for us, God. For we would be nowhere. God, we would be in hell if it wasn't for you, God. And we just thank you for what you've done for us, God. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, you freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me wide Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life brought me from the darkness into glorious light and you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again now death has no sting 
and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me white darkness into glory as a light. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life and brought me from the darkness. You know, it's that blood we sing growing up that's never lost its power for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows no, no matter how deep you feel. It still flows from Emmanuel's veins and so we are so grateful for the blood. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy I must say that this is it's a passage of scripture that I believe it's if there's ever been a season that in the vernacular of today society woke has this negative connotation but when's the church going to wake up when's the church going to do what the church is supposed to do we're not called to pack pews were called to evangelize, to preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What gospel? Not yours. Not mine. Not the church of God's. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Paul is addressing young Timothy. And 
Here's what he says. Begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 4. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up upon themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. And turn aside to fables. But you. Be watchful in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. May God bless the reading of the words. You may be seated. I'm afraid today too often we hear these words. We need revival again in the church. We need revival in this area or this area. But could I entertain you the thought before revival takes place in the church, it needs to take place in you. It needs to take place in me. We should be the living example that the people see. Do they want more of God? Well, how much do you have? We're enthusiastic about a lot of things, but are we enthusiastic about God? When game day comes and we know Saturday will roll around in football, we'll don on our favorite teams, but do you don on Christ? We'll pay exuberant fees to go watch somebody run up and down a basketball court come to Final Four. Go South Carolina. If y'all don't know, the girls are in the Final Four. You, you know, we're going to championship again. We're gonna, but anyway, but here's the thing. We will know those. And some people know stats of ball players better than they know the gospel. You and I must read the book. Why? Because the book instructs us. The book guides us. The book empowers us. And so if we ever want revival again, we got to say, here, Lord, start with me. I know it's easy to say, well, what about those over there? Well, if you quit judging those and say, God, what about me? You'll see you ain't so perfect. I'm not perfect either. So it's like I'm not the kettle calling the black, whatever that thing is. We, we just got to quit trying. See, here's the thing. I, 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 I'm excited, so just bear with me. Here's the thing. We want so bad to point out everybody else's issues to take the spotlight off of us. And so we'll go quick to social media and we'll blast somebody and say, oh, did you hear this? Did you hear that? The problem is, what if you were the subject? Put yourself in that individual shoes. It's easy to call out people's sin. But if you got sin in your own life, you better shut your mouth. I, I, I know that might be a little harsh for some. But... I grew up, my mama, my daddy said, if you ain't got nothing good to say about somebody, don't say it at all. You and I have the life and death is in the power of the tongue. I'm either going to encourage somebody in the Lord or destroy somebody in the Lord. I'm either going to be an example for Christ or not an example for Christ. See, I believe it's intentional. I believe it's ordained by God that we just started this revival. test. I say revival, but the testimonial service is taking place. Begin this thing with Sister Audrey. We had Brother Phil. And now this Wednesday night, we got his, his better half, as uh, some would say. He better at least say amen to that. You, you know, I'm just kidding. But, but here's the thing. We are moving in this testimonial side. Why? Because we have to let the world know the goodness of God. There's so many negatives out there, but we need to begin to broadcast. And listen, revival is defined as the act of an instance of reviving. Another definition says this, it's an improvement on the condition. But here's the problem. When we throw around the word revival, we think it's something bad. Oh, I remember revival growing up, preacher. It was weeks long. Is that a bad thing? 
Or what you're saying is, I, I, I don't want church that often. Be careful your words because they're powerful. I would love to get back to the days to where people would go and leave the church speaking in unknown tongues and go into work and being filled with the Holy Ghost. What would happen if at Cane Bay High School all of a sudden revival broke out in the most spirituals of sense? What would happen on your job? What would happen in your home if we were the receptors of God's presence through us moving in the community that we serve and bringing revival back to the land. See the church world, they want revival to look at but not to engage in. I want to be able to say that I was part of the big revival. But what part is that to play? Are you the intercessor of that revival? Are you the preacher of that revival? The singer, see, it doesn't matter the title, but you're either engaged or disengaged. You can't be, oh, I'm just, I'm just resting. You're not a Tesla being charged. And sometimes those are great not having to rely on gasoline and all of these things. But what happens when the charge is going low and you in the backwoods? See, we don't have charges in the backwoods. And there ain't no solar panels on the top trying to charge this thing. If we're not careful, we will follow the latest fad thinking that's going to make us spiritual. And God says, my word doesn't change. How do we get revival? We learn the word. We study. We pray. We seek God. The more I seek you, the more I find you. Why? Because he's a God that wants to be found. But are we a child that wants to be found? See, God was going in the garden every day to have relationships with Adam and Eve. But sin caused them to retreat from that. And they tucked and they hid. And I could just imagine God already knew where they were at. Adam, where you at? Eve, this ain't, you, you, you know, y'all hiding. What's up? Oh, he could have just went. It's like us playing with our kids. I know where my daughter hides. I know where my son would hide. But we're like, oh, have you seen them? Do you know where they're at? We know, but we've turned it into a game. And I'm afraid we've turned church into a game. We, we, we want people to, oh, lift me up, Lord. And, but then, hey, 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 don't, don't ask me where I've been over the weekend accountability brings revival we're accountable to God before anybody else why because he's your master he's your maker not me not the church not your spouse but him and if I hold myself accountable to him everybody else will fall in line why because I'm not here to please you I'm here to please him and if I please him he's going to spew blessings and favor on my life that will make other people want to be where I'm at but see, that's not the reason we pursue him. But it is a benefit of pursuing him. So you see, growing up, churches held revival and not because it was the coolest thing to do, but because people were hungry for God. Yes. When's the last time you feasted at the master's table? When's the, I, mean, I mean, it's free. As far as your money. But it cost commitment. It costs a willingness to go to the table. It doesn't close. It's 24-7. If you've ever been on a cruise, you can go eat anytime you want to. Now, there are some foods on the cruise that is not accessible, Sister Mary, 24-7. Because that restaurant is closed. But there is some food. There's always ice cream. There's always pizza and hot dogs and hamburgers. You can get it at 2 a.m., 4 a.m. You can get it at whatever a.m. or p.m. you want. But there are some things that are only accessible when it's open. And I believe that this is relation to the church. You can get fed at home. 
But there is some things that God says, I will feed you only when you come to my house. Because that's when the good stuff is cooked. That's when I'm ready to open up and say, I'm going to flood a blessing over you that you can't contain. Why? Because in my house is great blessings. But if you don't want to come to my house, why should I give you all that I have? See, I love my kids and I will give them anything. But if they never come to me, I can't give them everything. Because I don't know what they want. Now, I know certain things they want. Because it's what every kid wants. And as they grow up, things change. As you and I grow up, we shouldn't want the same things that we wanted when we first got saved. We should have a deeper understanding of the attributes of God. We should have an understanding of what God has in store for us. And so today, I want to help you with something. I'm going to dive right in. I know we got a time restraint a little bit, but I got an hour and 15 minutes to preach. All right. If you know how I'm going to be here in an hour and 15, they can hear the message too. We might resurrect the dead. Listen, in, in 2 Timothy 4 and 1, again, it says, I charge you. Now, listen, that charge is a Greek word actually meaning testimony. Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to testify of the goodness of God. I charge you there before God. What is Paul saying? He's simply saying, I had to testify before some members of the court and I was unashamed. I stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm encouraging you, young Timothy, to do the same. I charge you, meaning I command you almost to testify, to tell them about God. So why are we so ashamed? Oh, I might lose my job. Do you believe God can provide or not? I might lose my friends. Well, some of us need to lose some of them anyway. Listen, if your friend ain't elevating you in Christ, then they're demoting you in Christ. Because we need people that lift us up. We need people, oh, well, preach, I'm, I'm in this relationship because I'm going to pull them up. That's a lie. The statistical data that would show that a relationship, this is why Jesus says, do not be married to un, or unequally yoked with unbelievers. Why? Because you are not that strong. And we don't want to admit that we need God to help us in our relationship. And so we try to, I'm going to lift him up. Well, the gravitational pull is greater for them pulling me down than me pulling them up. But we think we're Superman or Wonder Woman or He-Man or, or some kind of Marvel character, whatever is your favorite. But when are we going to rely on God? If this is a relationship, God, I'm supposed to be in, make it flourish. If it's not the relationship I'm supposed to be in, shut the door. Yes. And listen, then we cry when the door is shut. Yeah. Ah! Really? God answered your prayer and you're upset. I'm not saying you didn't love them. I'm not saying that you, you didn't care for them. I'm just simply saying, if you pray God shut the door, if I'm supposed to go with somebody else or not be in this relationship and he shuts the door, quit complaining. Oh God, I just want this job. If it's your will, let me have this job. Open the door and no man can open and shut the door. No man can shut all oh, these wonderful phrases. But then when he does it, we upset at God. You either believe he can do it or you can't, and then you got to accept his will as it being his will. He knows best for you, like he knows best for me. Listen, Paul is telling Timothy this, that listen, I had to testify before the members of the court. You too, Paul was in ministry for over 30 years, and he's proclaiming the second coming of Jesus Christ. And many of you, like me, have been in church a long time. And we still believe that Christ is coming back. I believe he's coming back just like he said. I believe he's going to shout so loud that one day it's going to wake the dead. Why? Because he is a God that you can depend on. He is a God that is going to take care of you. So Paul goes and tells Timothy in verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He's emphasizing the word of God is constant in an inconstant world. 
God is one that you can rely on. Listen, let me just, I'm going to, I may upset some people, but if a program's what brought you to church, will you stay when the program's over? If the preacher's what got you in church, will you still remain in church when the preacher leaves? If the singing, if the teaching, if the kids program or the youth program, if all of that's what got you here, and I believe we should do everything with excellence and we should want to be what somebody wants to take a part of, but if it should stop, do you leave or do you stay? Because if we're pursuing things that entertain us, we will leave when the entertainment's over. But if we pursue God, if the word of God's what brought us to church and it stays preaching regardless of everything else, we'll want to stay in the word. Now listen, here's this thing. Paul is tell, or Timothy is hearing this and saying, listen, no matter what, I got to preach the word. That's what Timothy's instructing him. And no matter what, every life group teacher here today has to preach the word, teach it, preach it. Every singer's got to sing it. Why? Because it's going to be what sustains people in the midst of their storm. It's what we rely back on in the midst of it all. Yes, in the midst of it all, I know that God is faithful. In the midst of it all, I know that he's prosperity over me. Why? Because I'm his child and he wants the best for me. See, you and I are under the same commission. Preach the word. When you go to the job, preach the word. Now, this ain't saying bust out your King James 1911 or 1611 and say, oh, hear thee, hear thee, whoever you're teaching. Sometimes you have to live it without ever speaking it. Because, see, here's the thing. Long before I know you've been changed, I should see a change. I shouldn't have you broadcasting. I've been this, but I should see it long before I hear it. See, Brother Phil gave a great testimony Wednesday. And then on Thursday, maybe even Wednesday night, he's like, I wish I'd have had more time to tell about the goodness that God has been over us. But see, my wife brought this out last night. He never had to say how good God's been because we see it as evidence in his life. Now, there's a moments of bragging on God, and I'm not discounting that. I'm just simply saying with everything that he's pinpointed out, look, this is where sin took me. But we look at him now committed to church, in church, engaging church, wanting to do things above and beyond what has the requirements of him. Why? Because at the end of the day, change happens and it's broadcasted forth without any billboards, without anybody having to say something. His life is a representation of Christ. And that's where it needs to be. See, I know many ministries, they will feel their message, their Sunday messages, Wednesdays and all that with jokes and stories and give you a little bit of scripture and hope that that's going to sustain you. The word of God, listen, we, we'll joke sometimes, we'll tell a story, I'm going to tell you a story in just a minute, but that has to only be a small part of the message. If I'm covering everything else up with laughter and stories and you only hear a little bit of the gospel, how am I expecting you to grow? Because my commission from God is to preach the gospel, not to tell the latest joke. I don't want you to see me as funny. I want you to see me as a messenger of God. Now, sometimes laughter breaks up the tension. Sometimes a story helps it connect a little bit. Like this. Uh, let me just jump. There's a reverend, Leonard Ravenhill. Now, you may not know him. 
In 1907, he was born and he lived to 1994. He was a, uh, an English Christian evangelist. He went around preaching. His emphasis was on prayer and revival. Now, I want to read you some of his quotes. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is praying is not praying, is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, but few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. If the church fails to pray, we have failed. Amen. He goes on to write this. There are two kinds of people in the world, only two. Not black or white, rich or poor, but either dead in sin or dead to sin. See, we, we, we complicate Christianity. And this young man is preaching the gospel and he goes on and says, if we displease God, does it matter who we please? But if we please God, does it matter who we displease? See, you and I have got to get back to this. Do we want revival or not? I want revival. We've seen some big revivals in your lifetime and, and, and some in mine. Some of y'all are more seasoned than me. In 1904 through 1905, we see the Welsh revival. 1906, anybody know what happened in 1906? It was a revival that took place. The Azusa Street Revival. It lasted more than eight years. Have you heard of the Brownsville revival in Florida? It started on Father's Day and it lasted five years. Five years. The Lakeland revival, one of the most recent big revivals that we see is in 2008 and it lasted about eight months. What am I saying? When's revival coming again? When are we going to put life on hold and put God in the basket again? I want God to move. I want to see the children of this generation be able to cast demons out, be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. It will never happen if the church doesn't pray. Well, preacher, you know, we got to go through this educational process. That's a lie from the enemy. Every child that's back there Every child that Sister Kathy is teaching right now, every child that Sister Bobby Sue teaches and Sister Audrey teaches, they're not even hit teenage years yet, can lay hands on a sick and see them recover. They can lay hands on a dead person and see them resurrected. They can list people or pray for people and see them come to Christ as a personal Savior. Why? Because God is not constrained to an age. We make it problematic we act as if they're not able to do certain things and so revival won't come as long as we regulate the church this is God's church not my church not your church I know we want to say this is my church and listen I want you to take ownership because if you'll take ownership you'll stay and fight but at the end of the day what is God wanting for his church God's wanting you and I to move and advance in the kingdom of God. So we got to pursue him and, and grow in him. And I may lose some family members in my pursuit, but I gain family. Well, they may not look like me. And they may not come from the same tree that I come from, except the spiritual tree. I would much rather connect with my spiritual tree than the DNA tree. Because some DNAs define the, gen the generational issues that flow. It it's the generational curse. Or we could say, man, this is hereditary. If it's hereditary physically, is it not hereditary spiritually? 
If the church that I grew up in was spiritual and it's hereditary, should not I be spiritual? But I can stop the issues of some hereditariness of the physical so I can stop some of the spiritual. See, my grandfather who adopted me was an alcoholic. My biological father was an alcoholic. I won't stand here today and say, listen, if, if, if you, you don't go to hell if, if you drink. That's between you and God. I don't think it's good for you. I think it'll mess you up. I think there's a lot of negativity to it. But here's what I'm saying. I'm simply saying I have seen the destruction that it did to my grandfather. I have seen the destruction that it done to my biological father. So in my most conscientious of minds, I don't want that to be a part of my family. So I make a conscious decision not to engage. If I know sin is destructive, I got to make a conscious effort not to engage in sin so that I can reap the benefits of my heavenly father that wants to bless me. But I will never be blessed by him if I engage the things that is despicable to him. Oh, but preacher, you know, hey, I don't think this is, listen, I don't want to take the chance. The pleasures of sin is only for a season. That means there's an expiration to it. But there's a great cost to it. And do you have the funds to pay for it? I'm, I, I mean, I was sitting there and uh, when Brother Phil was giving his testimony uh, about those things. Listen, it is but by the grace of God. All of us can tell the story of how God has preserved us. How, what things God has prevented us from ever dabbing into or ever engaging in. Why? Because our Father loves us. He loves us so much that He wants to revive us. He wants to take us to a place that we've never been. Because listen, revivals don't last forever. But we should want to be a part of it. He said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I want him to start here. I know that may be a little selfish for some of y'all to accept. But listen, if God's going to give something, hear me. Hear me, Lord. Start with me. If he's no respecter of persons, then that means he could, in fact, do it. And if he can do it and he starts with me, does it affect you? Does it cause you to have a greater hunger for God? See, we don't need revival through messages. We need revival through prayer. Just because we got revival services does not mean it's going to create revival. It's only the presumption of this that says, oh, yes, we're going to come and expect. But if we expect and never receive, did revival ever happen? Sometimes the revival seed was planted. And then when you go home and he begins to water it, it begins to rise up this thirst that I got to have more of him. And I'm going to engage more of him because, see, I don't believe it's coincidental that God placed in my spirit the testimonial service on Wednesday night and revival and monumental all in the same year. I believe God wants to do something great in this church. I believe that God wants to do something supernatural in this church. But here's my dilemma. Luke 9 and 26 is my dilemma. The Bible says, for whosoever or whoever is ashamed of me and my words. Of him, the son of man will be ashamed. When he comes in his glory. Now watch this. We, we, just, we just quote this. You know, if, uh, if, he's, if we're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of us. But it goes on and says in his glory. And in his father's and the holy angels. It's not just God that will be ashamed of you. The holy angels are going to be ashamed. Why? Because for God to die on a cross, to pay for the sins that you and I have, and to give you and I life, and to make a way that we can be with him in heaven. Yes, the angels know what heaven's like, but he's given us glimpses. If you don't know what it's like, read Revelation. 
It tells us what heaven's going to be like. It tells us the hell we're going to have to fight to get there. But it also says that we're blessed when we read it. Meaning God is empowering you in high. That if we want more of him, we got to engage him more. And the more that we engage him, we see his faithfulness. See, it's not easy to talk about the death roll of Jesus. What do I mean? I'm just simply mean, if I'm going to follow him, some things are going to have to die. And it also means that if I'm going to engage in him, I'm going to have persecution come my way. Now, I'm not just talking about, well, you know, somebody unfollowed me on Facebook. If that's your persecution, grow up. Actually, probably get off social media altogether. Because if you're offended that somebody unfollowed you or unfriended you on social media and that's what you call persecution, you have no idea what's about to come. Because what's about to come is where if you go into Revelation, I think it's around 10 or 11, it actually begins to talk about the mark of the beast. That's persecution. My son and my daughter and I, we went to the air show yesterday, and while we're standing there looking at airplanes, all of a sudden we hear the, the, the bombs going off that's part of the program. And I kindly looked as I was engaged in a conversation with somebody, and I said, this is only a little bit of what Ukraine is experiencing. I looked at my son, and I said, this is what Israel goes through almost on a daily basis. See, I was in Israel when they were bombing just right at the border. We've not been bombed yet. We've not had somebody bust in our church or in our home and rip our family out from our hands. We've not had them come and strip our kids away while they're in school and all of a sudden an army go in and kidnap every one of them without you and I knowing and only to find out the grim reality when it's too late. That's persecution. Not sitting in a hot church hearing, well, you know, preacher, that wasn't King James. I'm being persecuted. When persecution comes, you're going to know it. And the reason I'm preaching on revival is because we need to be fighters again. We need to stand up and fight for our children, fight for our people, and fight for the next generation. Because at the end of the day, the blood's on our hands. We're either going to worship God or sit down on God. We're either really going to be an example of the goodness of God or talk about how God is unfaithful. God is not unfaithful. He is conscious of everything that he does. I believe it's time that we renew our alliance with Jesus. So understand this verse as I get ready to close. There's more I can go in, but listen. Jesus showed love. And it brought individuals to hate him. Jesus healed. And it brought individuals wanting to kill him. Jesus brought salvation. And it caused people to want to stone him. Jesus brought forgiveness. But it caused people to judge him. Jesus' birth took the control that man had over people. And put it in their hands. For them to choose this day whom you will serve. See, you and I have to ask ourselves, are we ashamed of the God that has done all that for us? And if we're not ashamed, then where's our stance? I'm not saying to go right now and pull out your social media and say, I stand for Jesus. That should be already interpreted by what's on your page. By what you like. If I was to go and look in your home, would you be ashamed of what's in there? See, but I'm just a man. What if God, Friday my daughter and I were singing, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And you know the song. Zacchaeus climbed up that sycamore tree for more of him he wanted to see. Jesus comes by says, Zacchaeus, 
you come down for I'm going to your house today. And as Jesus went to the home of a sinner, there were still those that judged him. We're called to make a difference in this world. We're called to love people. Love as Christ loved. See, a shame means that you don't want to be seen together. A shame means that I don't want to talk about it. And a shame means I want to avoid it at all possible. Can I tell you today, don't be ashamed of him. He loves you too much. He wants to use you to make an impact in this world. I want you to stay. There's more I could preach and probably need to at another date. But in verse 5, Paul concludes to Timothy and he says, Be watchful. Be watchful. I want to charge every man right here, right now. It's our charge to protect our home. What's allowed in it? What's what our kids watch? And while I was typing this, let me just because this is what I, I, I feel and pay attention. You are commanded to lead your home. You better be watchful of the things coming in it, being done in it. And here's where the Lord got me. And what is setting up camp around it? The enemy's not happy when we take a stand. And so he's going to camp around us, but I see in the spiritual. When the prophet comes out and he's unafraid of the army that's camped around him. And he goes back to his table. But the young servant is terrified. And the prophet just prays this prayer. Father, remove the scales that he may see. And what he saw was angels camped around. And see, I'm not scared of what the enemy's trying to camp around my home. Can I be honest with you? I'm scared if I can't see angels camping around them because I'm losing it then. My job as a protector of my home is to ensure that angels camp out at my house. And if we ever want revival to come, my job as the pastor is to ensure that angels camp out this place. And so I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's in your home. I don't know. That's between you and God right here, right now. But I believe today that God wants... God wants... Have you realign your walk with His? To realign your passion with His passion. To realign your commitment with the commitment that He made to you. And yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He committed His life to sinners. Because he wants a relationship with us. So in this house, maybe you would be honest with yourself and say, Pastor, I need an, an alignment with God. I'm not saying you backslid. I'm just saying that you realize that you need an alignment back with God. If that's you, I just want you to look this way and put your head right back down. Yes, I see you. Yes. Here's what we're going to do. There's a, there's a soft spirit in this place. 
I just want you right now just to begin to talk with God. You could be the very one that brings revival to Somerville. Revival to Ridgeville. To Charleston. To Give Ends. To Monk's Corner. To Goose Creek. You could be the one that brings revival to this church. You could be the one that brings revival to your family. Bring revival to this nation. I don't know the plans that God has for you, but He does. And He said it's to prosper. So God, with every head bowed and every eye closed, and as we begin to ask you, realign us. Father, I stand at the center of this house and ask you, would you realign me? Make sure that I'm in alignment with you. Let me grieve what you grieve. Let me rejoice what you rejoice over. Let me break what breaks you. Let me hear the heartbeat of you. I want revival in this church. I want revival in this land. But it won't happen if we can't be revived. So God, revive me. Let me be an example to the church that you have blessed me with. And as we walk and engage in this world, Let us walk with a testimony that says, God is my rescuer. Let us be able to show people the depths in which God will reach for His children and the blessings that He has for those that diligently seek Him. So Lord, right now, would you strengthen all of us to be a witness for you? To not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not be unafraid to talk with you or to be associated with you. But may we stand locking arms together as one body with one mission serving one God that we all may reach one destination together. Heaven. Now, Father, as we go our way, in just a bit, we will open up these doors to a grieving family, to bury a a loved one that was taken way before we felt it was his time. May we as a church show the love that you show serve in the capacity in the way that you serve and those that we engage with today God may we show them that even in a traumatic moment there's still peace to be found there's still hope to be found in God and to those that will walk through these doors that do not know you as Lord and Savior May by the time they leave, give their heart to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love on somebody. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of God.